this word. I wish I'd heard this word when I was a new Christian. It would have helped me grow faster. So this word I'm about to share this morning, it's in my spirit. It's something I've been living out for decades, but it's in my spirit, so it flows easily. And um, it's uh, perhaps a new concept for older Christians. One of the hardest things to do is to unlearn to unlearn some things. And sometimes there's things we learn, sometimes we've got to unlearn some things. And, um, and so I'm having to learn, unlearn some things in order to get closer to Jesus, to see Jesus through different eyes. And, and so he shares different concepts. Revelation comes from heaven. And, you know, sometimes the old, you know, it talks about the old wineskin is an inflexible thing and the new wineskin is a flexible thing. And uh, the new wine cannot go into old wineskins. It flows into new wineskins because the old wineskins are not inflexible enough. And sometimes I have to be flexible in my heart and know that the truth that I had that set me free then, that truth, it, it, Peter talked about it and he said, uh, we have this present truth. But as we follow Jesus, the truth, it leads us into greater and greater revelations of truth, which sets us freer and freer. And so what I once thought was truth that set me free back there 30, 40 years ago, compared to today, I thought, wow, I wish I knew this, knowing this. But, you know, it's line upon line, precept upon precept. So we're going to, um, yeah, so. When you came into the door, when you came into the church this morning, you came through the door, of course. You've got to come through a door to get into a building. And uh, to come to Jesus, Jesus is called the way, the truth, the life. He is the door. To come to God, you don't come through a church door. You don't come through a religion. You don't come through a, a, a religious system. You come through a person, a faith in a person. His name is Jesus. He is the door. He's the way, the truth, the life. So you come to him. Through, he is the door. But sometimes you come to a church through a building and you find out about Jesus. Sometimes it can be in a house group. It can be on the streets. There's different ways that we come to Jesus, but he is the door, number one. But the Christian faith is based on six foundations. It's found in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 1. And Paul said, not laying again the foundation. So you know, when you build a house, you, you build it on sand, eh? If you build a house on sand, you're going to have a good house. It's going to stay there for years. Yeah? Well, okay, build it on mud then. Build it on a swamp. Yeah? No. Nah. Build it on a rock? Yeah, right. Just, just, just trick it. And so the foundation of what you build on determines how long that, that, that building's going to last. And Jesus talks about building on the rock. And the rock is the word of God, the values of God's word, the ways of Jesus. That's the rock we build our lives on. Eh? And so, so there are six foundation stones of the Christian faith found in Hebrews 6. The first one, and I'll just say it, it says, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works. So the first foundation is repentance. Now, repentance is to make a U-turn. It's to be going this way and then you can go... The opposite way. And for me, when I came to Jesus, I was walking in a way of life that was destructive to me, to my marriage and to my family. It was destructive to society because I had to self-destruct on the inside. When I met Jesus, I heard there's another way I could live following his ways. And so when I came to Jesus, I had to consider, do I want to follow his ways or keep walking? And I chose, I want to follow his ways. It didn't mean I instantly start walking in the ways of Jesus. Anyone else? Did it happen straight away? Didn't I? But I, I had a mind change. I'm going to walk in another way. And that's called repentance from dead works. That's the first door we walk through to come to Jesus. The second door is faith towards God. So then faith towards God. The third door is uh, doctrine of baptisms. Uh, the fourth door is laying on of hands. Fifth door is resurrection from the dead. And the sixth door is eternal judgments. These are just six foundation Found, uh, Christian foundations found in Hebrews 6. So the first door is repent, then believe, baptisms, laying on of hands. But let's just look at the first three. Repent, believe, and baptisms. So I have uh, had the honor of ministering to many people over the thousands of Christians. And um, sometimes some Christians are still, still struggling with issues with sin, 
in their lives with habit patterns, with, um, with um, just problems, issues, relationship problems. And this is in spite of receiving years of counseling, years of support, years of help. And I've often wondered, why is that? Why is it that some Christians take longer to grow in Christ than others? And I found out one of the reasons, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I want to talk about today, two truths. I want to talk about the first door you come through to Christ, and the second truth is about what does born again mean. Okay, so the first door, when we come to Jesus, how did you come to Jesus? Don't tell me, but just in your mind. Yeah. My life was crap. <laughs> I knew I had to change my life. So I, I, I came through the door of <sighs> repentance. Not even understanding what that meant. I, I, I want to change my life. If, I'm going to, if Jess is going to stay with me, I've got to change. And the only way I know that I can change is God. And we both said that. So we came through the door of repentance. Then we said, well, let's go to church. Then we went through the door of faith with God. We began to learn about God, put faith in God, believe in God. And then we got baptized. <clears throat> so the first door... Could you put the first PowerPoint up, please? Let's look at the first door that John the Baptist, that Jesus, that Peter, that Paul, they all spoke about this first door. So let's read them together. If you can see at the top there, Matthew 3, let's read it together. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first door to come to Christ is repent. Let's read what Jesus said, Mark 1.15. And saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe. Peter, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. Let's read Paul. Testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. So the first door of the foundation of building the strong foundation for our Christian work is repent then believe, then baptisms. So it's repent and believe. And then I realize why sometimes some of, uh, some of God's people have issues um, dealing with or not dealing with, with, with uh, habits and stuff. It's because they never repented. They never came through the door of repentance. They came through the wrong door. And it says in Hebrews 6 that repent, believe, Baptisms, laying on of hands, eternal judgments, and resurrection for the dead. It, it, resurrection for the dead, eternal judgments. It says, and if we complete these, we, we will move forward if God permits. If God permits. You know, to get a building built, you've got to have a building permit. And to build your life on, in God, you've got to, God permits. But it's got to be on the foundation here. He doesn't want us laying on a, a wrong foundation. It's first is repent, believe. Baptism. So repent and then believe is the first two foundation stones in a Christian life. And if we do it in a sequential basis, it says God will let us move on if he permits. So he wants us to make sure that our lives are built on the right foundation. And so I realized for some people, not everybody, but for some Christians after years of counseling and years of help and years of support and they're still struggling with sin, still struggling with their flesh, that they've never repented. They never got to that. They never came to Jesus through repent door. They came through believe door. I need help. I need, I need, I need food. I need, I need some comfort. I, I need free from depression. And that's all good. Jesus wants to set us free from our needs. So we come and we believe in Jesus. But without understanding that we have to re that repentance is meant to be part of the deal, that I'm going to turn away from getting drunk every night because getting drunk and stoned and you know, getting arguments with my wife and with the police, it's always a problem, but, uh, but it's the devil. It's just the devil, you know, he's after me. The devil's trying to stop me from following, believing in Jesus. And so, you know, and I... I would get stoned and I'd get drunk and go to church and I felt guilty. And I thought, oh, it's the devil, you know, it's the devil, he's after me. And this would happen week after week and months actually until um, I realized it wasn't the devil, it was me. <laughs> and that if I stop getting stoned and getting drunk, then the cops won't pull me up. And uh, I said, oh man, what's that? That's called repent. 
That means a change of mind, a change of lifestyle. And so that was the journey of learning to follow Jesus, was through changing the way I was living and starting to live according to his ways. And so when you haven't, when, when, a, when, a, when one doesn't realize they have to, it's, it's not have to, it's a matter of following Jesus, it's turning away from the old ways. When one doesn't understand that, then they believe in God, but they still have the sense of entitlement, the sense of I belong to myself, I can still do whatever I want. And, uh, and so when I have a bit of an argument with my wife or somebody or I want to do my own thing, well, I'll just go ahead and do it and cause conflict. And that's believing. So it's believing, doctrine of baptism, getting baptized, and then living a messy life. But Jesus doesn't want Christians living a messy life. He wants Christians to repent, believe, and yes, live a messy life, but in the process of following Jesus, that messy life becomes cleaner, better and better. More, less and less conflict, more and more divine order. So one of the first doors that many Christians come to Jesus through is the door of belief. And it's the wrong door. Jesus preached, John the Baptist preached, repent, believe. Jesus preached, repent, believe. Paul, Peter preached, repent, believe. Paul preached, repent, believe. The early church preached, repent, believe. The writer of Hebrews talked about repent and believe. And so... That, that's not the whole message. I just wanted to share that, and I have shared it. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. Now, now I want to go into this. I mean, that's good. That's a good part. But th this is even better. This is freaky. Okay, let's do the next PowerPoint, please, which we just talked about. That's what the Scripture says. Not laying again in the yellow. Let's read it out. Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. So the foundation is repent and then faith towards God. So I believe in Jesus. I believe he died for me. I believe I can be free from my attitudes, from my rebellion in my heart. I believe all that. Uh, but I don't make any difference. I just keep walking in that way. But repent us now. I make a change of mind. Do you know when you change your mind, God will help change your heart? Sometimes it's really hard to, I mean, it took me a while to give up so many things. I was trying to follow Jesus the best I could. And I found the best thing to do is just change your mind. Say, Lord, I want to live it your ways. When you change your mind, the Holy Ghost will help change your heart. That's, what it, that's how it's worked for me. Because a lot of things... I had to repent from it too hard. Too hard for me. But not for him. Greater is he within us than he that's in this world. And the more I yielded my mind to him, the more the Holy Spirit helped turn my heart. And I'm still in process. I'm still following Jesus, learning to repent. It's a lifestyle. It's like when you repent, you don't just suddenly repent of everything. When I repented, oh Lord, I will no longer, I made my mind up, I was not going to take drugs anymore. And I repented from that. I made it mind change. And then when the drugs came to me, I said, help me, Jesus. And he helped turn my heart to follow my decision. And, um, and so I repented of my drugs. I got set free of my drugs. But I had a lot of other issues. There's still a lot of other areas of my life I needed to repent of. And it's a process of walking with Jesus. So when you repent, it doesn't mean suddenly it, you've, everything's clean. You, everything's, you're, you're perfect. It doesn't mean that. It means it's a lifestyle of walk, walking in repentance and following Jesus and letting his grace set us free. Kapoi, I just want to make sure you understand repentance is grace, but repentance is a gift. When we make a change of mind, then the Holy Ghost helps us change our heart. So make sure you come through the door of repent. Okay? Otherwise you'll say, well, God, what do you want me to, what, what's this? I suddenly don't feel that I'm not meant to be doing this and that and and, and you, know, you can start feeling entitled and confused. There's conflict. I thought that life was going to be easy. And the Lord says, yeah, it's going to be easy, but you know, just repent from the stuff that's bringing destruction into your life and conflict into your relationships and just repent, turn away from that. Okay, anyway, I'm going to move on to the next thing. Next PowerPoint, please. <laughs> Do you know when you were, we were all born with a sinful heart, Thank God that he does heart transplants. You can be born with a diseased heart, but today humans can take out a diseased heart and put a healthy heart in. Isn't that amazing? When you and I were born, we were born with a sinful nature, with a corrupt human nature. 
But thank God he can take that old nature out, that old heart out, and put a new one in. And that's what he did. When we got born again, he gave you and I a new heart. Transplant. It's reality. So let's read these words. To believe without understanding the process of repentance, one still lives a selfish and total life they were born with. When one gives Jesus permission to be Lord of their life, changes start happening. God gives us a heart transplant from a sinful nature to a pure nature. See, I, when I first became a Christian, I was told you're a new creation. It says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, anyone in Christ is a new creature. So I thought I was totally new. But I was only new in my spirit. Okay? When you were born again, you were born again in your spirit. Your spirit became new. Your spirit became the part of you that just loves to worship God, loves to go to church, loves to read the Bible, loves to pray. That part of you, that's new. That's brand new. That's pure. But the soul isn't. The soul has to be renewed. The soul's just got the old habit patterns, the old thought patterns. And as, as we learn to yield our soul to the, to the spirit within us and uh, begin to make the spirit, the spirit rule over the soul instead of the soul saying, oh, I feel a bit tired today. I, I just don't feel like praying. I just, and that, that's when the soul becomes higher than the spirit, that the soul controls the person. But repent means, no, I'm going to follow Jesus. I'm going to follow the spirit of the Lord. So it's a process. And uh, God has given us a pure spirit. He hasn't given you a pure soul. The soul is neither good or evil. It just does whatever you tell it. <laughs> if you yield it to sin, it will be a sinful soul. If you yield your soul to righteousness, it will become a righteous soul. You know, it's, it's like a glass. You, know, you can fill it with poison or with, with pure water. You can fill your soul, your mind, your emotions, your thoughts with pure or impure thoughts. It's a choice. And God wants us to yield to the Holy Spirit so our soul is yielded. And when our soul's yielded to the Spirit, then the body begins to experience transformations. Next one, please. Okay. Oh, come on. Let's read this together, please. Before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. You were a pure spirit being before you became a sinful human being. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the Spirit will return to God who gave it. I knew you before you were born. Most Times I've thought, oh, as a little baby, you knew me before I was born. That it signifies when I'm born, he knew me. No, no, no. It says before you came out of your mother's womb, before you were a baby, God said, I knew you. I knew you. I knew you. What part of you did God create first? Your spirit, your soul, or your body? Your spirit and your soul. And then what's the second part he made? He breathed into the dust. So the first part of you that God knew before you were born is your spirit. Think about it. He knew your spirit. Do you remember that? I don't. Our memory's got erased, so to speak. We've got spiritual amnesia. But he knew us, but we don't, we don't remember him, but he knew us. That's what he says. Before you were born, I, before you came into your mother's womb, I had ordained you. Uh, in Psalm 139, he says, I, you were fearfully and wonderfully made. All the days were numbered when as yet there were none for your life. God knew us. He knew us in heaven. We were a spirit. I was a spirit in heaven, and so were you. I, I, I existed. I was a person. I was a, you were, and I were a spirit being before we became a physical human being. You caught, catch this? This, this is the, the foundation, the door that I have to It's a different concept, perhaps, for some. Okay? Now think about this. What sort of person were you? What sort of person do you think you were in heaven? Hmm, Pure. Really think I mean I meditated on this and think, what's God knew me? And whose image were you created in? God's. When we were born into the earth, we were born into the image of the first Adam. And that Adam had a corrupt nature. He sinned. So we're born, we're a spirit being in heaven, we're pure. 
Because you have to be pure in heaven. You can't have any sin in you. So we had to be pure beings. We loved God. <laughs> we had no addictions. We had no fears. For God has not given you a spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound mind. We had no um, depression. We had no history on the earth which caused trauma into our lives. We were a pure being. Imagine that. Woohoo! And then... This is weird. God causes us to be born into a corrupt human nature. That pure spirit that you were, you were born into a corrupt human nature. <laughs> Isn't that weird? It says the spirit will return to God who gave it. The, your spirit is pure now. We'll get back to that in a minute. So we're born physically into a corrupt, and that's where our soul is selfish and sinful. And then Jesus says, unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom. You're with me? So we we're born, we we're created in the image of God as a spirit being. We were born into a corrupt human nature, born. Jesus, is, but you have to be born again to that spirit nature that you had before I knew you. You get born again and your spirit becomes a new creation. You, you reclaim that who you used to be in the presence of God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Lucifer used to be in the presence of God. He used to worship. He used to, uh, take, he used to uh, uh, had the ministry of worship. He used to be in the presence of God and he was pure until he sinned and he was cast out. Jesus said, I saw, saw him fall like lightning. We have also been in the presence of God. You who? We're not. We have been in the presence of God. What sort of being were you? You were a pure being, a perfect being, divine. Now you're born again in the image of God, the Spirit of God. You now, your spirit being is the same as it was when it was with that Jesus knew. It's the same being. Let's see the next PowerPoint, please. Jesus replied, let's read it together. Jesus replied, very truly I tell you, no one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 1 Corinthians 17, but he that is, is one. To be born again means we, we ask Jesus to forgive us of our sins and for him to come into our hearts. His spirit comes into our heart. And his spirit and our spirit join together. We are joined as one spirit. And our spirit is born again. Our spirit becomes a new creation. Our spirit is, is in the same Condition, the same pure condition that it was when we were in heaven. Now, some of you are trying to become more like Jesus. You're trying to, it's about laws and rules. I'm not trying to, do, and I will not do that. I won't swear. I won't say this. Won't. And you're busy trying to patch up the old corrupt nature you were born into. And good luck with that. You're going to be busy trying to be a good Christian. Because you're thinking that you're still, you're corrupt. But you're not corrupt. You're not corrupt. Your spirit is not corrupt. Your spirit is pure. And you will find more victory by believing who God says you are than trying to fight who the devil is keeps reminding you that you used to be. The devil will say, oh, you call yourself, you did this and you did. Of course, we have a history in a corrupt human being. But we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been born again of the Spirit of God. We now have the pure spirit, a pure divine nature that doesn't sin. And if you can believe that and, and learn to walk in the Spirit, your soul will eventually follow. And as you begin to renew the mind and renew the spirit of your mind, we begin to think and yield our emotions, set our affections on the things above where God is seated, not on the things of the earth. As we discipline and yield our soul to the perfection of our spirit, then you become much more and more like Jesus from glory to glory. Are you with me? You're tracking? Next one, please. So let's read this. By which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the that through the promise of God, that if you're born again, the born again, he that is in Christ is a new creation, all things are, there are promises God gives. And so that promise, part of that promise is 
through the promise that we become partakers of the... So we were born into a sinful human nature. When we were born again, we are now partakers of the... Your spirit is pure. Your spirit is perfect. Your spirit doesn't need any work. Your spirit has no fear. Your spirit has no history. Your spirit is not sinful. Your spirit hasn't been ravaged by the, by the ravages of sin and, and, and torment and the law of sin. Your spirit is ready to worship God any time, any place, under any conditions. <laughs> Your spirit wants to read the word, wants to worship God, wants to pray anytime, anywhere. Any, your spirit does. Your soul does it, but your spirit does. And soulish Christians are those who are still, tr who believe that they're no different, that, oh, I'm just trying to be a good Christian. Stop trying and just start believing. Your spirit already is. In the eyes of God, you're pure. <sighs> Learn to surrender to who Jesus made you, a new spirit man, instead of fighting against who you used to be. Sila. Okay, it gets, gets worse. Next one, please. Come on, read this out loud. Whoever has been born of God does not... Pardon? Pardon? Do you sin? But what's this say? What's truth and what's opinion? What's truth? So when it says... He that is born of God, he's talking about the spirit part of us, born again. God's spirit in us does not sin. Oh, read on. For his seed remains in him, and he cannot. Come on. Yeah. I remember when I first read these scriptures, so there's got to be a mistake. <laughs> cannot sin because he has been? What does born again mean? I think so many Christians have missed the understanding of what born again means is that your spirit has literally been born again. It is born back into the same uh, position, the same relationship, the same purity that it had with God before you came out of your mother's womb. You, that spirit being, that pure spirit being that you were, that's who you are now on the, in, in your spirit. You don't have to try and get there. You are there. And that part of you, that your spirit, it cannot sin. Because it says your spirit and God's spirit are joined together. Can God's spirit sin? Of course not. And your spirit and his are called one spirit. So my spirit can't sin. The voice of your spirit is your conscience. Okay, your conscience. <clears throat> your conscience. So if you want to know the difference between your mind and your conscience, your mind will justify why you can do something you know you shouldn't be doing. Your mind can justify it. Human rationale justifies. My mind might say, oh, well, go and have that extra piece of Pastor Mark ice cream sponge. Come on, eat the half. Eat half of it. It's no one will see. No one will know. But my spirit says, my conscience says, no, 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 no. Have some, but not all. So your mind can justify, your mind can think things, but your conscience is the voice of your spirit. Listen to the voice of your spirit. He's pure. He's pure. That's your spirit speaking. And God wants us to learn to be walked by the spirit, not by the flesh. If we learn to walk by the spirit, we get set free from the things that put us into bondage and conflict in our soul. Drugs, addictions, attitudes, unbelief, fear opinionated, all that's of the soul. But the Spirit's none of those things. The Spirit is like Jesus. The Spirit is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Is this helping somebody? <sighs> uh, could we go back one, please? Back one PowerPoint. Back one more. Back one more. Okay, Ecclesiastes down the bottom. Then the dust will, re uh, will return to the earth as it was. Let's read the bottom. And the spirit will return to God. So if I take a cup, I go to your house and you say, I say look, I'd like a cup of coffee. You say, yeah, help yourself. You're part of the family now. So I go to the, your cupboard, I get a mug out, and I make myself some coffee, and I have a coffee, and then I wash the mug, and I return it, don't I? I return it. I return it. Return. 
You only return something somewhere if it's already come from there. You re, you're, if, because it comes from there originally, then you return. It says when our body dies, our spirit returns to where? To God. Return. It can only, our spirit can only, your spirit can only return to God because it already came. Got it? Before you were born, I knew you. I, you were a spirit being before you were a human being. You were a sinless spirit being before you become a corrupt human being. That's why we had to be washed with the blood and born again of the incorruptible seed of God, the spirit of God. And we are new created beings and our spirit man. And if we could learn to yield more and live out of our spirit than out of our soul, oh, I'm having a bad day. Oh, well, it's okay to have bad days. It's life. But we don't have to live there. We don't have to live in the soul. We don't have to live in our flesh. Oh, I'm tired. I'm aching. I'm this. I'm that. And I'm cold. Or I'm hot. I'm going to church. It's too hot. Or it's too cold. And say so that's Christ, uh, being moved by the flesh or being moved by the soul. But God wants it to be moved by our spirit. That our spirit loves to worship God. Our spirit loves praying. Our spirit loves church. Our spirit loves one another. <laughs> your spirit loves your children. Loves your husband, loves your wife. Your spirit loves people. Mine does too. And that's what helps me love the unlovable. Because Jesus loves all people. How could he do that? How could he love me? Because he's spirit. He's Jesus. God is love. And that spirit of God, the love of the spirit of love, it's in us. And if we try to love people or get on with people out of our soul, it's always going to have conflict. Oh, I don't feel, oh yeah, let's want a cup of coffee. But inside, rah, 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 rah. So it's living out of the soul, out of emotion, out of, out of attitude, out of thoughts. But if we live out of the spirit, my spirit loves them. My spirit sees that one as a brother. Others might see... The, the, the scum of the earth, but my spirit doesn't. My spirit sees a son of God, a child of God. Isn't that how Jesus, that's how he saw me? To me, he was a swear word, but to him I wasn't. I was somebody made in his image. I was somebody made in his image. To you, he might have been a swear word or just a religious figure, but to you, you were everything to him. He said, I die for you. I'll die for you because I love you so much. I loved you before you knew me. I loved you. Before you loved me, I loved you. That's his spirit. And that's who you were. We were before we were born. We had that spirit. We were that being in heaven. Before you were born, I knew you. Yeah, you were made in my image. Remember? No, we had we got amnesia. And it was white from I don't, I don't remember being in heaven, do you? I think when we go to heaven, there's going to be a lot of uh, sequential dots being joined. Ting, ting, ting. And sometimes when we're talking together, it's like the dots would line up. You think, wow, I just got a picture. I just got a flash of revelation. God was there. God was there. Joseph, when he came out of, when he went into Egypt and his brothers tried to kill him. Years later, 22 years later, he said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God made it for good. He said, I was in the place of God. And his spirit knew and understood that God's behind my future, not my brothers, not selling me as a slave, not false rape accusations, not being put in prison. God is behind my life. I can look to God. I can trust God because my life is in him and that he can bring to pass my destiny. And he lived out of his spirit, Joseph did. While he lived in captivity in Egypt, he was living out of his spirit, not out of his soul. He didn't get uh, uh, angry or, um, or resentful towards his brothers. He stayed sweet. You don't have to get resentful. There's, re there's people that will get up your nose all the time. And I tell you what, God, the devil will make sure he sends somebody to get up your nose every day. He wants you to live in your soul. He wants to remind you that's who you used to be. Come on, just tell me it's stuffed. Just react like you used to be. And the devil wants us to keep reminding you of who you used to be, of your old patterns. 
Unless you begin to believe the truth that who God says you are a new creation now and you, you are no longer a prisoner to your soul, you are new. You don't have to live like that. You have an option now. You have an option to live as a sinful human being, a corrupt human being, or as a sinless spirit being like Jesus. You're already free. Some of you, stop struggling. Stop trying to patch up your old sinful self. That, that's dead. It says in Romans 6, consider yourself dead to sin. That old man, he's not worth heck. Don't patch him up. He's, he's not worth keeping around. Oh, but I, you know, I used, to, used to feel like that. I used to, oh, we used to get drunk. And be, oh, we had some great times. And we, uh, mm, yeah, really. <laughs> that's who you used to be. You keep going down that track, it'll take you back out of who you, into lies and darkness. But the light, he's the light, he's the way. He says, no, this is who you are. You're a new creation. Next one, please. Oh, next PowerPoint, please. Next PowerPoint, please. Okay, down the bottom, John 3, 6. Let's read it together. That which is born of the flesh is, which is selfish, it hates God. That which is born of the spirit is spirit, loves God. So... Your spirit, you live in the flesh, you live in a physical body, but you have a choice whether to live by the spirit, by the flesh and the soul, or to live by the spirit. And they that are led of the spirit of God, they shall be called the children of God. Whoever is led by the spirit of God is not subject to the lusts of the flesh. It's about learning how to stay connected to living out of your spirit. I learned to minister out of my spirit. I learned to live out of my spirit. And sometimes the, the soul wants to live, eh? The soul, ah, don't do that. But would Jesus do that? So I'm learning, just like you, I'm learning to live out of my spirit. And the more I do, the, the, the less conflict, the more breakthroughs I have. Next one, please. Next one, please. Isn't that amazing? You do not sin. Is that the last one? Oh, right. Think about that. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. <laughs> Come on. Have you been born of God? Well, the Word of God says you don't sin. Your spirit doesn't sin. Your soul can still sin. Your flesh can still sin. So what if it does? Well, if it does, 1 John 3, 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sin to him, he's just to forgive and cleanse us. You just, it's just like, just get, a, you know, get, get the blood of Jesus and just wash it off your, your robe. Simple as that. You're not perfect. We're not perfect. And if we do stuff up, just say, oh, God, I'm sorry. I was such a jerk. Please forgive me. Yeah, sweet ass, move on. This is how you're going to treat yourself. It's, it's your flesh. It's your soul. It's not your spirit. But what if I died and I hadn't apologized? You'll go to heaven. Why? Because it's your spirit, not your soul. It's God knows who you are. It's your spirit. The thief on the cross. He says, Jesus, remember me when you come. Jesus says, today you'll be with me in? Okay. He didn't say to the thief, now nah, get off the cross and go get baptized first. He didn't say that. He didn't say to the cross, no, no, get off the cross and go deny yourself and take up your cross daily and then follow me. If you lose your life, you'll find it. If you find it, you'll... He didn't say that to the thief. So the thief, he had faith for salvation. Salvation, entrance into heaven, listen to me, it's a free gift. Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is... So the thief didn't do anything to earn eternal life, and neither can you and I. He went immediately to be with God, with Jesus, is in heaven. So eternal life is free. It costs you nothing. It costs Jesus everything, but it costs you and I nothing. It's a gift. But to follow Jesus in this world for the rest of our life, to follow Jesus, there is a cost. You hear me? There is a cost. This is why it's important to understand repentance. The price of following Jesus... It's Luke 9.23, it says, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. 
For he that loses his old flesh soul life will find his spirit life. But he that finds his old flesh soul life, who wants that life, they're going to lose that spirit life. So there is a price to be a disciple. There is a price to follow Jesus as a disciple. Okay, that, that's, that takes faith. <laughs> Kids, buy. There's a big difference. So you say, but what if I, what if I do that? Hey, your name's already in the book of life. Your reservation's been made by the blood of Jesus. Titus uh, chapter 3, verse 5. Not by any works which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Through the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost. Okay? There are people who are, who are uh, about to die today, who are, going to, who are going to commit suicide. There's people who are going to be, going to be killed and they don't even, they're going to be murdered. But if they call on the name of the Lord just before their spirit leaves their body, they'll be saved. If they call on his name, he will save them. Because it's the spirit, you see. But we have the chance to live the rest of our life on the earth by serving God and serving one another. We have the chance to live out of our spirit, not our selfish soul, not our selfish flesh, but out of our sinless spirit. And it, and it, and it just takes discipline, and, uh, but there's no condemnation in it. You don't feel condemned if you stuff up. You just, ah, oh, sorry, God, I made a... Uh, that was the old man that stepped in there. Someone, uh, Indian uh, parable was, this chief, um, someone asked this chief how he was going. Uh, and he said, um, depends which dog I'm feeding. And he said, what do, you, what do you mean? He says, well, I've got a black dog and I've got a white dog on the inside. The black dog's the bad part of me, the, the white dog's the good part of me. And uh, my day depends on which dog I'm feeding <laughs> And your day determines, my day depends on which person I believe I am. Who Jesus says I am, or who my past says I used to be. Please believe what God says about you. Your soul, your spirit does not sin. You do not sin. You are pure. Before you were born, Jesus knew you, and he loved you then. And guess what? He, he knows you now, and he loves you now. His love never changed, because you always never lost sight of who you really are. You might have lost sight. We might have you know, spiritual amnesia, but he never lost sight of every creation he's created. That's why he says, God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in will not perish, but he have everlasting life because he sees who we were made. He, we see the baby, oh, cute, innocent. Nah, that poor little baby's been born into a sinful, corrupt nature. <clears throat> Do they go to heaven? Yes, of course they go to heaven. They're sinless. But... Anyway, amen.